Hello everybody! Great to be back. I didn't manage to do it yesterday because we had another kids party uh, so I had to go out for that and it is freezing here at the moment. Um, uh, honestly it is just like, it's literally freezing. I mean there's, there's uh, ice and frost and snow and all that stuff, hence my big woolly jumper. Um, I don't really like the cold. Sometimes I like it. Sometimes if there's loads of snow and you can have make snow people and throw snowballs and snow angels and all that kind of thing. I quite like the snow, but when it's just cold, I hate it. I just want to move somewhere warm and you can go swimming in a swimming pool outside and it's nice. And you can sunbathe and just read a book on the beach and we have the worst weather here. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop, mo stop moaning now because, uh, because, you know nothing I can do about it but um, I am going to start instead of moaning reading The Fury um, we're so close to the end of this book we've only got about 50 pages left and um, uh, probably get through about half of that today um, it's all gone really terribly wrong uh, but basically um, they've, they've realised that what they've got inside them this thing that's making other people react so in such a hostile way is what well, they've dubbed an angel, they don't know if it's an actual angel or not, but Rilke is convinced it's an angel. She's convinced that she's been possessed by this angel that will help her purge Earth of humankind um, because she's she's quite bitter and she doesn't like human beings and she feels like the world would be better without them. And um, and the others, uh, well, I think Jade and Marcus have kind of teamed up with her. The others are, they know there's something in there, but they don't really want to think about it or believe what it is. Uh, and they're more concerned at the moment with starving to death because there's no food. And they, they're going to try and break into the fertiliser factory down the road to try and get some food. Um, but they know that if they are encountered by anyone there, those people will turn against them. And Rilke, the last thing Rilke did before we finished, um, is has just called the police to say there is going to be a break-in or a terrorist attack at the fertiliser factory. Uh, so I'm guessing that Cal and Brick and Daisy and the others aren't going to be alone. Uh, it all kicks off uh, in these last few chapters um, which we won't finish today, but I'll try and finish them tomorrow. Daisy, Hemingway, 5.34pm. By the time Daisy had finally managed to clip in her seatbelt, they were already slowing down. The factory loomed up from the horizon, a cluster of black buildings and half a dozen towering chimneys which pierced the brilliant blue sky. It looked like a dead fly with its legs in the air, Daisy thought. There was nothing else nearby apart from a sign on the side of the road that said, Thanks for visiting Hemingway and Furzville. Please drive safely. The same bug-eyed squirrel grinned at them from it. Furzville itself lay half a mile behind them now. You see anything? Cal asked. The factory entrance was just set just off the road up a short wide driveway. There was no gate, just a barrier. On either side of that were big walls topped with mean-looking spikes. There was a booth there too, a little one with a door and a window attached to the main building. There's somebody in there, Daisy said, seeing a blurred shape behind the sun-drenched glass. I think we should turn around. It might just be one person, Chris said, letting the engine idle. And he might have fifty mates out the back, Brick said, or a hundred. Daisy felt her stomach complain. It was partly fear, but mostly hunger. She wished they could just phone the factory people and ask them to bring out some food. Wouldn't they do that for a car full of kids? Yeah. We should call them, said Cal, scooping the thought out of her brain. Look, it's right there, Cavendish Harbright. We could 180 it. Sorry, we could 118 it. That's phoning the directory. And say what, Brick asked. Hi there, we're just wondering if there's anyone in today because we'd like to break in and steal some stuff. No, you idiot, we could just see if anyone answers. Chris tapped a button in the centre of the dashboard and a keypad appeared on the touch screen there. Nice, said Cal. Does it have a signal? Let's find out, he said, typing in 118118. There was a hum, then a flurry of numbers and a voice sounded from the car's speakers. Daisy tuned it out, gazing through the window and back towards Furzville. The whole park looked tiny and shimmered in the baking heat. It didn't seem real, as though any minute now the view would just flicker and switch off. It was a crazy thought, but surely not anywhere near as crazy as having creatures inside them. Angels. And yet it felt so right, what Rilke had said. Well, most of what she'd said. What lived in them wasn't really angels, she didn't think. These weren't the same things her mum had pictures of in the house, the ones she'd become obsessed with when she was ill. Those had smiling faces and rosy cheeks and sat on fluffy clouds. These, these were different. Daisy didn't have the right words to explain how, only that they weren't alive in the same sense that people were. They couldn't live here in this world. 
That's why they'd chosen her and Cal and Brick and the others. They needed a body to ride around in, the same way that humans needed cars to get places. Only these angels couldn't control you like a person controlled a car. It was more like they just rode around with you, giving you strength, fire like Schiller's, but waiting for you to make the right decisions. Was that right? Daisy wasn't sure. They were good, though, these things. Not like nice people, more like a friendly animal, like a dog or a tiger. They wouldn't speak, but they would look after you. That's where the ice cubes in her head came from, those little glimpses of other people's lives. Only other people with angels in them, she realised. Sorry, only other people with angels in them, though, she realised. That's how they talked to each other. Shall I put you straight through, said the voice from the speakers. Uh, Yes, thanks, said Chris. There was a soft click, then more ringing. The big question was why the angels were here. There was no way that angels would make them murder people. Rilke was wrong, really wrong. Daisy didn't blame her. It wasn't like they'd all been given a big instruction book or anything. None of them had any idea what they were supposed to do. But they weren't here to hurt people. Daisy was sure of it. Nobody's answering, said Brick, as the ringtone continued to fill the car. Really? said Cal. I thought somebody had picked up and was just making phone impressions. Brick had his mouth open to reply when a voice blasted out of the speakers. Welcome to Cavendish Harbright Harbright Agricultural Technologies. That's hard to say. Our office hours are 9am to 5pm, Monday to Friday. If you require emergency assistance or product advice outside office hours, please hold. Music. Something classical that reminded Daisy of her drama class. The memory of it was like somebody had slapped her around the face. The play! They would have done it by now. Emily Horton would have played Juliet. She would have kissed Fred. It should have been her. The hunger in her tummy turned into something much worse, like she was being crushed. Tears ran down her cheek, but she wiped them away before anyone could notice, taking a couple of deep, shuddering breaths until the weight lifted. She couldn't worry about the play now. There were more important things. There had better be anyway. There had to be a reason for this, something that made it all okay, otherwise she'd have lost everything. Everything. For nothing. It's the thing you saw, she thought. The man in the storm. He's the reason you're here. You have to fight him. And even though the memory of that creature was terrifying, the thought settled her. They were here to stop him before he could eat the whole world. That's what he wants to do, she thought. He wants to eat everything until there's nothing left but darkness. Hello, said a voice through the speakers, making Daisy jump. Oh, yeah, hello, said Chris, looking urgently at the others and mouthing, what do I say? Um, how are you? Cal was pointing at the booth, and they all squinted through the glass to see that the person inside was on the phone. This is an emergency number, the voice said. We're closed. If you just want to chat, call back tomorrow. Uh, Wait, said Cal, leaning between the front seats. We need to speak with somebody urgently. Is it an emergency? Uh, Yeah, Cal went on. Uh, We're outside, and we think someone might be trying to break in. What? hissed Brick. Are you trying to get us caught? Who is this? the man repeated. Outside, on the road, a gang in a silver car. They look suspicious said Cal. There was a clunk, a squeak, shuffling noises. Then the door of the booth opened. Daisy ducked down, peeking as a man in a security guard's uniform appeared. He cupped a hand over his forehead, looking towards the jag. What the hell are you doing? Brick said. Trust me, said Cal, he's going to come over. Chris, as soon as he gets close enough, move off, okay? Drive slowly, make him follow you back up to Furzville. There are plenty of places to turn around up there. Just make sure you keep him hooked and lock the doors, yeah? Sure said Chris, his voice a tremor. No probs. The guard reached into his booth for his cap, putting it on, then walking out into the sun. Daisy could hear his footsteps crunching on the sandy track as he approached the road. He wasn't far away. Any second now, he'd sense them. She took Adam's hand, squeezing it. If he gets too close, then you just floor it, Cal went on, doing his best to smile at Daisy. Keep him safe, whatever happens. He popped open his door, the car rocking as he got out. Come on, Brick, you're up. No way, man. I'm staying in here, Brick said, snorting a laugh. Why doesn't Chris go? Can you drive? Cal asked. The guard was walking fast, shouting something at them. Brick swore, slamming a hand down on the glove box. Come on, mate, said Cal. This is your chance to be a hero. Brick grabbed the handle and shouldered open the door, almost knocking Cal over. Hey, stay stay where you are, the guard yelled. He was jogging now, a big belly swinging beneath his tight grey shirt. Good luck, said Daisy, putting her hand on the window. Cal pressed his against the other side as Brick slammed the door shut. Be safe, Cal. Please be safe. 
You too, he said. We'll meet you at Soapy's, yeah? Got you, said Chris, pressing a button to make the doors lock. Good luck. Who are you? The guard's mouth was drooping out of shape, his eyes filling with a depthless rage. Daisy pushed herself away from the door as his steps became lurches, then bounds, propelling him down the last section of path. Go! yelled Cal, running into the ocean of seagrass that grew by the side of the road. Brick followed him, both boys ducking out of sight as the guard careened towards the car. Oh crap, I should have thought about this, said Chris. He spun the wheel, trying to turn around. The back of the Jaguar slammed against the verge as he reversed, and the engine almost stalled. Daisy screamed as the guard threw himself against the window, thumping the glass. He butted his head against it, his nose bending at a weird angle. Blood gushed past his yellow teeth, but he didn't notice. He didn't know anything now except the fury. Chris revved hard. The front of the car scuffed the verge at the other side of the road, bumping up and down. Then they were clear. Remembering what he was supposed to be doing, he eased on the brakes. Daisy looked through the back window to see the guard tearing after them, his face a mask of cruelty and anger. Behind him, sneaking from their hiding place, Cal and Brick jogged across the road towards the factory. Be safe, Daisy said to them. Good luck. But she had an awful feeling that luck wasn't going to be enough. Cal, Cavendish Harbright Agricultural Technologies. 5.46pm. Brick reached the booth first, running through the open door so hard that he almost ripped it off its hinges. Cal skidded to a halt outside, casting a look back up the road. He could just about make out the glinting roof of the jag, the guard's guttural shouts drifting back on the wind. His pulse was so fast and so hard in his throat that he felt like there were fingers there, squeezing. Cal, come on! Brick was at the door, furiously waving his hand. Cal pushed past him into the small room. It was empty, just a desk, a control panel, a couple of security monitors and a phone with the receiver out of the cradle. He lifted it to hear the roar of a car. Hello? Chris, are you still there? Cal? Chris's voice was laced with panic. Yeah, we just got in. There's nobody else here. You guys all right? A pause, then Daisy's voice. He's catching up. We're okay, Chris said. Go on, get it done. Cal dropped the phone back on the desk, keeping the line open. Brick was focusing on the monitors, clicking a switch that changed which camera was being shown. Looks dead in there, he said. Cal walked across the booth to the other door, opening it a crack to see a short corridor. He stepped through, stopping when he heard Brick's voice. This might come in handy, the other boy said, pulling a sheet of paper from the wall and handing it to Cal. It was a plan of the factory, made up of fine lines and even smaller print. Cal recognised the booth in which they stood, and, close by, a big rectangle marked Staff. It's got to be it, he said, pointing. Right? One way to find out. They walked through the door, Brick doubling back to pick up a giant mag-like torch from the desk. He held it like a rounder's bat as they ran down the corridor, past a big reception room and a toilet. There was another door at the far end, and Cal opened it up onto a sunlit courtyard. Two jeeps with the factory's logo sat there, alongside a dented blue rover. Cal glanced at the map, getting his bearings. That way, he said, setting off. They jogged past the cars, their ragged breathing the only sound in the entire place. The factory loomed over them, giant chimneys casting finger-like shadows over the open ground. He increased his speed, making for a squat, low building dead ahead. They'd almost reached it, when another security guard appeared a short woman who strolled out from between two huge gleaming silos about 30 metres away, swinging a set of keys around her finger. (whistles) She was whistling, the tune cutting out when she saw them. Cal skidded to a halt against the wall, Brick running into him, and for a second all three of them stood like statues. Are you uh, Rogers, kids? the woman asked, dropping the keys into her pocket and reaching for her radio. You can't be playing back here. She walked briskly towards them, speaking into her handset. Her words dropped into a low, wet groan, the whine of a dying dog. Then she was running, her hat flying off. Cal ripped open the door, but Brick held his ground. The woman reached him, her fingers hooked like talons, her teeth gnashing. Brick didn't hesitate, swinging the maglite. It struck her in the jaw, the crack echoing between the buildings. The woman dropped, a gout of blood spurting from her broken mouth. She twitched, then lay still. Brick stumbled away, throwing the torch on top of her like it was a poisonous snake. Get a radio, Cal yelled. 
Brick snatched it up from the ground, running to the door. Oh, Christ, he muttered. I, I didn't mean to hit her so hard. She'll be okay, said Cal, grabbing the walkie-talkie from Brick's fing trembling fingers. You didn't have a choice. They were in another corridor, this one longer and darker. The only light was coming from a door up ahead on the left. Cal lifted the radio and pressed the button. Is anyone there? he whispered. There was only static. He repeated the question, still no response. If there were more guards here, then someone would answer, wouldn't they? I don't know, said Brick. He was as white as a sheet, staring at his hands. Cal grabbed his arm, dragging him towards the door. A, gl <clears throat> a glance inside revealed a big room lined with lockers and empty coat hooks. They jogged a little further, past another toilet and a room packed with sofas. Come on, Cal thought. They were running out of corridor. It has to be here. It was. The last door they reached led into a canteen with dozens of tables and chairs and a big silver counter. Cal ran past it, through a set of double doors, and he was grinning by the time Brick caught up. Whoa, said Brick. Whoa indeed. They were in a kitchen similar to the one in Furzville, only this place was spotless. There was food everywhere, shelf after shelf of cans and jars and packets and tubs and bottles. Brick angled straight for a crate of bread, ripping open a whole, a whole meal loaf and wolfing down three slices. Cal was tempted to do the same, a pressure in his gut almost dragging him towards the mountain of crisp, buckets, crisp boxes in the corner. But they might not have long. They had to take what they could. Bags, he said, dropping the radio on the floor and pointing towards a pile of sacks. He upturned one, releasing an, an avalanche of potatoes. Brick did the same, both of them working in silence as they looted. Cal stopped when he could barely lift what he had, spinning the sack around to seal up the top. He dragged it towards the door. Are you nearly done? Brick spat through a mouthful of something. He dropped a tin of spaghetti hoops into the sack, then spun it closed, hefting it over his shoulder. They were running out of the kitchen when the radio bleeped. The sound almost stopped Cal's heart dead, and he lost his grip on the sack, a box of coconut wafers dropping to the floor. There was a burst of static, then a man's voice. Roger? Claire? You there? They tore through the double doors into the canteen, but even from here they could hear the radio bleep again, the amplified voice chasing them back out into the corridor. Guys, what's going on? The police are here. Oh no. Daisy, Hemingway, 6.05pm. The security guard was getting tired, but he wasn't slowing down. He chased after the car with that same ferocious expression, his bloody teeth bared, his fingers stretched out towards them. His feet scuffed the road and at one point he even tripped, falling flat on his face. Chris slammed on the brakes, waiting for the man to push himself up. He teetered, looked for a second like he might be coming out of it, then caught scent of them again and stumbled forwards. It was horrible. The guard didn't know what he was doing and they were going to kill him at this rate. Couldn't they stop the car and just put a sack over him like they'd done with the other man? At least that way he couldn't hurt himself. She didn't suggest it though, just in case she was the one who had to run out and do it. Chris slowed as he reached the end of the road, Furzville almost directly opposite them now. Left or right? he said, glancing at Daisy in the rearview mirror. The guard almost caught them again, his fingers squeaking on the boot as Chris made a, a decision and swung left. Daisy heard the man utter a soft mule as he scuffed his way along the road after them, his shirt hanging out over his big belly and one foot shoeless. The poor guy. She wished there was something she could do. Surely there was a way to switch off whatever was making them so angry. If the man knew what was inside them, that it was something good, then he wouldn't try to kill them. If Daisy was right and the angels were here to fight the man in the storm, then they were helping people, not hurting them. Chris pulled into the abandoned showroom across from the park, turning in a circle so that they were pointing back the way they'd come. The man shuffled towards them in a pitiful, shambling run. He tripped, falling again, and this time Daisy heard the crack of a broken bone. That's enough, she said, watching the guard try to push himself up. A red nub of bone was sticking out of his forearm, but there was still nothing in his narrow eyes but rage. Please, Chris, he's going to die. I don't know what else to do, Chris said. We can't let him catch us, and we can't leave him here because he'll go back to the factory. The man had somehow made it back onto his feet. He stumbled round across the forecourt, his good arm held out. He hit the window, slapping it with no real strength. Chris swore, moving the car out onto the road again. The ambulance shot by so quickly that it made their car rock. 
Daisy screamed, watching in horror as the ambulance wobbled, clipping the high verge and spinning into a series of cartwheels. It disintegrated as it rolled, shedding glass and metal and plastic for what must have been 50 metres before lying still. The engine ignited with a soft puff, smoke drifting lazily into the flawless sky. Only the security guard was moving, still throwing weak punches at the side of the car. What the hell? said Chris, his words drowned out by another siren. This one was a police car, catapulting past them and skidding to a halt beside the ruined ambulance. Oh no, oh no, this is really bad. Two policemen scrambled out of the car. One of them ran towards the ambulance, the other stared at the Jaguar. He shouted something to them, but the wind snatched it away. Chris spun the wheel around, accelerating to the left, away from the accident. The the security guard toppled over behind them, but Daisy was no longer watching him. She was gazing across the flat land towards the factory and the flickering blue haze which surrounded it. Oh no. Cal, Cavendish Harbright, Agricultural Technologies. 6.11pm. It wasn't just the police. A fire engine was coming through the open barrier, its clacks and still blaring. There was already a cop car in the courtyard, and was that a bomb disposal van on the road? Cal ducked back inside the door of the staff block. We've had it, he said. What happened, Brick asked. How'd they even get here so quickly? It's been, what, 20 minutes since we broke in? They looked at each other, and the answer seemed to dangle in front of them in the gloom. Rilke, they both said together. Brick threw his sack of food to the floor. I'm going to kill her. At this rate, he wasn't going to get the chance. Cal could hear shouts amongst the sirens, dozens of them. Luckily, nobody was close enough yet for the fury to trigger, but it wouldn't be long. They were already sorry. There were there were already people running this way through the shimmering blue light. He gently clicked the door closed. His thoughts wheeling. Is there another way out? He said. How would I know? Brick asked. I left the map back there, didn't I? They set off, dragging their bags of food. There had to be a back exit, surely, for fires and stuff. Cal glanced up, seeing the familiar green emergency signs with the running stick man on them. He followed them inside the canteen, crashing through the double doors. It took him a second to spot the fire exit at the rear of the kitchen. They were halfway there when they heard a voice from outside, distorted by a loudspeaker. This is the police. We know you're inside. Return to the front of the facility immediately. Man, it's like a bank robbery or something, Brick said. What are they worried about? That we're going to steal a big bag of horse manure? It's fertiliser, isn't it, said Cal. It's what terrorists make bombs out of. Out of horse crap said Brick as they reached the door. Seriously? Oh, shut it, Brick. We need to be quiet. Cal pushed the bar in the centre of the door, nudging it open. There was a soft click. Then the silence of the room was torn apart by a clanging alarm. Oh, real quiet, Cal, said Brick, punching open the door and legging it outside. Cal ran after him, a blanket of bells sitting over the whole factory. They were in another courtyard smaller this time, with a squat square building dead ahead and more massive industrial vats to the right. Right behind those was the wall, five metres high and crowned with black spikes. This is your last chance, or this is your last chance, said the loudspeaker man, muffled but still painfully clear. Cal thought he heard a bark, the sound making his skin grow cold. Ferals he could outrun, dogs he couldn't. What now, he said. There were footsteps close by. He glanced over his shoulder, imagining fifty cops tearing around the corner of the staff block. Brick was moving towards the shining metal vats, each of them four, maybe five times as high as the wall. The giant silos were held in a nest of white scaffolding, and it didn't take him long to work out what Brick was planning. The barks were louder now, heading their way, and there was another sound too, the distant woof, 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 woof of a helicopter. I don't think helicopters actually make that noise. <laughs> I'm going to stop trying to make a helicopter noise. You know what a helicopter sounds like. Why the hell did it have to be a fertiliser factory? He had to force himself to start moving again, panic making his body feel twice as heavy as it actually was, filling his bones with lead. The sack didn't help, and he nearly dropped it. But if they left here empty-handed, then they'd be right back where they started. Brick was obviously thinking the same thing, because he was spinning his bag around like a hammer, throwing a, a hammer thrower at the Olympics. He let go of it, food spilling out in a tight circle as the sack rose up towards the top of the wall. It didn't quite make it, bouncing off the bricks and thumping back onto the dirt. He ran to it, picking up cans and cartons and lobbing them individually over the spikes. 
Cal tore open his own bag and started throwing too, a barrage of food sta- sailing over the wall. He'd thrown seven or eight items when he heard voices much closer now. That'll do, he yelled, throwing over the now nearly empty sack. Let's go! They both ran to the nearest silo. Brick went first, jumping and grabbing one of the thick, one of the thick diagonal struts of the scaffolding. He, gl- he grunted as he hauled himself up, his feet struggling for purchase on the smooth metal. He made it to the next one and Cal followed. His fingers slipped on the first attempt, jarring his knee as he fell back onto the concrete. He ignored the pain, leaping up and grabbing hold just as the first policeman ran into sight. The man started to call out, but the word never made it as the fury took over. He threw himself across the the courtyard, his mouth open too wide, his eyes black pebbles. Cal's heart almost juddered to a halt. He reached for the next pole, clutching it and pulling his feet up as the cop slammed into the bottom of the scaffold. Fingernails raked at his ankles, the man's mouth a dark, gnashing pit. Cal climbed, not caring that he was overtaking Brick. They pushed against each other, their frantic movements almost knocking them both loose. Two more uniformed figures skidded past the side of the staff block, changing into ferals without missing a step. They clustered at the base of the silo, clawing upwards. A fourth appeared, slipping on a can and cracking his head open on the ground. Keep going, Brick said, navigating his way up the side of the silo. Cal looped his arm around the next strut, almost slipping into the ocean of hands and teeth that swelled beneath him. He hung there, the terror almost too much for him, leaving him faint. He nearly fell, then Brick's hand was on his arm. Don't you dare, the other boy said. You're not leaving me on my own. His feet found something solid and he pushed himself up to the next level. More and more police were piling into the courtyard, howling as the fury overwhelmed them. Their eyes burned into Cal. There were dogs too, their tails between their legs as they watched their masters turn into beasts. Brick was level with the wall now. He stretched out one arm, the spikes almost close enough to touch. But it was a long drop, and certain death lay in the surging, shrieking chaos below. Do it, Cal said, you can make it! Brick swore. Then with a choked cry he pushed off the scaffold and flapped towards the wall. He hit hard, grunting, but he managed to hook his hand over the top and pull himself up. The bass thump was louder now. A helicopter flew overhead, like a bloated blue bottle. Cal could imagine the pilot's face as he looked down, seeing his police mates baying like wolves. You coming or what? said Brick, moving carefully to the side. Cal eased up another couple of struts, trying and failing not to look down. The courtyard was now a heaving mass of black uniforms and hate-filled faces. He took a deep breath, then threw himself at the wall, his stomach turning in wild circles as he reached out for one of the spikes. It sliced into his hand, but he held on, hauling himself up until he was perched on the edge. A quick glance down the other side revealed a sheer drop into a patchy meadow, nothing but sand and seagrass and assorted items of food. Together, they eased themselves round, hanging over the drop. The helicopter spun overhead, angling ever lower, battering them with a hurricane of wind and noise. Cal looked at Brick and smiled. This is insane. If we die, I just want you to know that you're an asshole. he shouted. Brick grinned back. I know. Then they both let go. Rilke. Furyville, 6.14pm. It was like watching a dozen different films at once on a television that flicked wildly and randomly between channels. Rilke could make out snippets, a huge steel container that flashed brilliantly in the sun, a wall with spikes on it, a moving car, an ambulance in flames. But she couldn't make much sense of what she saw. All she knew that was her plan was working. The others, the ones who'd turned their back on her, were now at the mercy of the Fury. They would either drown in an ocean of human rage, or they would be forced to take action, to do what it was they were here to do. They would have to fight back. She opened her eyes. Some of the madness outside was bleeding into the restaurant. Faint sirens faded in and out with the soft lull of the sea, plus the guttering roar of a fire. There was a helicopter too. She wondered how long it would hang in the sky before its pilot was consumed by the fury. Shouldn't we go and help them? whispered Jade. They'll die out there. Not if they embrace their gift, Rilke replied. Schiller had been quiet for a while now, but he was starting to stir. He tilted his head up, looking at her with eyes of fire. 
His left arm still hung oddly, a lump beneath his skin where the joint had popped out. He didn't seem to be in pain, in, though. If anything, he was stronger than she'd ever known him to be, his gaze so intense that she had to look away. But what happens when the others are caught or killed, Marcus asked. Won't the police come here? Won't they sense us? Yes, she said, glancing at her brother again. But we'll be ready for them. Won't we, Shill? Schiller lifted his good arm, studying his hand as if he'd never seen it before. It burst into flames, soft blue tongues which, to which caressed his skin, darting between his fingers. He pressed the burning palm against his dislocated shoulder, those playful flames spreading. With a series of ugly, wet cracks, his arms slotted <coughs> back into place. He held both hands in front of him, radiating cold light. He was smiling. Oh yes, Rilke said, grinning back. We'll be ready. Daisy, Hemingway, 6.15pm. Turn around, Chris. We can't leave them. Chris ignored her, the car accelerating hard, an invisible hand pushing her back into her seat. She cried out again, and this time he slammed on the brakes, tyres squealing as they shuddered to a halt. It wasn't her pleas that had stopped him, though. Up ahead, blocking the road, was a police car, its blue lights flashing. No! Chris yelled, wrestling with the gear stick and reversing. He swung the car around, gouging a chunk of dirt from the verge as he drove back the way they'd come. The police gave chase, pulling up close behind them. Daisy twisted, looking at the policewoman driver, seeing the exact moment that her face went from normal angry to feral angry. She let go of the wheel, reaching over it. The man next to her was doing the same, leaning forward in his seat, his cries misting up the windscreen. With nobody steering it, the police car slammed into the angled roadside verge, flopping up and then down, the windows shattering and the airbags deploying. Chris was going too fast for her to see what happened to the people inside. The burning ambulance was up ahead, and Chris jerked the wheel, Daisy sliding across the leather seat into Adam as they re-entered Soapy's car lot. Two policemen were waiting for them, one flashed past the window, too fast for the fury to kick in, the other bounced off the bonnet, rolling over the car and hitting the floor limply. Oh, Chris, no! Daisy wailed. You're killing them! He didn't answer her, his eyes bulging in the mirror. He kept his foot down as they ploughed towards the rusty fence at the back of the forecourt. Daisy wrapped her arms around Adam, the boy still as quiet as a mouse, the impact bumping her into the air and cracking her head against the roof. She blinked away the pain, seeing that they were in a huge open field. The factory sat at the other end of it, its ugly bulk filling up the cracked windscreen. She bit down on, a, on another cry as the car bounced over the uneven ground, her insides feeling like they were being shaken to pieces. At least they were going in the right direction again. They might be able to find Cal and Brick. A fresh siren. Another police car pushing through the loose flap of fence and giving chase. This one was bigger. One of those giant truck things. It hardly even seemed to notice the craters and hillocks of the field, looming up behind them like a shark in the ocean. Don't! Daisy cried out to the policeman inside, her voice lost in the thunder of engines. You'll get hurt! But they'd already turned to feral. Nothing but glinting eyes and half-moons of teeth in the darkness of the four-wheel drive. It shunted them, the back of their car jolting off the ground. The view through the windows lurched like a ship's wheelhouse in a stormy sea. She had time to see the ditch ahead of them, a deep scar that ran the width of the field. Then the car plunged into it, and her world flickered off. Daisy! Cow. Hemingway, 6.23pm. Cal cried out as he landed, his legs sinking into the soft, beachy soil. This time the pain in his knee was like a poisoned knife, twisting into the cartilage. There was a thud as Brick dropped beside him, rolling clumsily away from the wall. He scrabbled to his feet and picked up the sack Cal had thrown over, before running back and offering Cal a hand. You okay? he asked, hauling him up. The pain flared as he pulled his foot free, and he couldn't stop the moan tumbling from his lips. Ah, oh, I'm fine, he said, limping across the rough ground. Brick ran off, frantically foraging for food in the short grass and throwing anything he found into the sack. From behind them came a nerve-shredding chorus of banshee wails and the thunder of fists against the wall. The cops would go back to normal as soon as he and Brick were out of range, then they'd start the chase again. The helicopter roared above them, flattening the strands of seagrass and making the field ripple like water. It was pumping out so much noise that Cal didn't hear the growl of the engines until there was an almighty crunch from the other side of the field. He looked up, 
to see a silver car flip end over end, its bonnet crumpled up like a fist, punching into the dirt, then collapsing onto its roof. A police Land Rover somersaulted gracefully over it, losing momentum mid-air and tumbling sideways. Smoke spewed from the wrecks, but through the billowing black curtain, Cal recognised the driver. It's Chris, he said, pointing. He began to run, his twisted knee forgotten. Here they come, yelled Brick, slinging the half-empty sack over his shoulder. Cal glanced back to see four or five cops charging from the main road, all of them shouting and pointing. They were a hundred metres away, maybe, but they'd soon catch up once the Fury had them. (sighs) We're going to die, Cal thought, and he was surprised by the lack of emotion. It was a statement of fact, one that seemed to carry no weight. If anything, it filled him with a trace of relief. No more running, no more hiding, no more not knowing, just death. And then he thought of Daisy, upside down in the car, clawing at the window as petrol fumes filled her lungs. He ran harder, putting his head down, overtaking Brick. In the distance, another Land Rover was emerging from Soapy's, the bulk of Furzville hanging over it like a dark cloud as it accelerated across the field. Incredibly, somebody was clambering out of the crashed one too, a broken shape whose police uniform had all all but been torn away. The man staggered onto his feet, then seemed to collapse on the upturned jag, kicking at the windows. What do we do? Brick said, wheezing. They were halfway between the factory and the car now, the sound of shouting behind them rising up, even over the thunder of the chopper. There were barks too. It wouldn't be long before Cal felt needled teeth in his legs dragging him to the ground. Then it would be game over. Cal, what do we do? He didn't have a plan, only his instinct. If they could just get to the car, if they could just reach Daisy, if they could just get back to the park, they'd be okay. Keep running, he shouted as they closed the gap. The other Land Rover was going to beat them to it, but it didn't matter. Keep running, Brick, and trust me. Daisy, Hemingway, 6.25pm. Somebody was shaking Daisy from a dream of fire. She was glad, because in her dream the whole world was burning, but instead of heat there was cold, bodies freezing and buildings collapsing while ash-coloured snow fell from the heavens. She snapped open her eyes, thinking at first that her dream had come true. Everything was wrong, the world upside down, her her head full of horrible choking smoke. Her body ached, but there was a really bad pain slicing in, I'm sorry, there was a really bad slicing pain in her neck. When she reached up, no, down, she felt a noose there digging into her skin. It took her a moment to understand it was her seatbelt. It took her another moment to realise that Adam was next to her, crouching on the ceiling, which was now the floor. His small hands were on her shoulders, shaking her wildly, and his sooty face opened up like a flower when he saw that she'd come round. Are you okay? she wanted to ask, the words coming out as a hacking cough. Something was banging, a bare foot crunching against the window, the toes bruised and bent unnaturally. Daisy's memories shone in the smoke, the police car that had chased them, then Chris driving into a ditch. Chris. He too was suspended the wrong way up in the driving seat. Blood dripped freely from his nose, forming a little pool on the ceiling. She called his name between more coughs, but he didn't respond. Adam was fiddling with something on the seat, and she followed his hands to her seatbelt clip. The button was jammed, not budging no matter how hard she pressed it. A powerful wave of claustrophobia ripped through her, and she cried out, tugging the belt in an attempt to free it. There was a funny smell in the air behind the smoke. It was the way her dad smelled every time he put the barbecue on in summer. It was the horrible fuel stink that came right before a fire. Go, she said to Adam, get out! She wasn't sure if they were words or just coughs. Either way, Adam showed no sign of leaving. He pulled at her, belt, making soft, scared whimpers. His face screwed up with the effort. She could hear another engine sound from outside. Then their car rocked wildly as something thumped into it. The cramped space seemed to shrink and darken even further, like it was sinking into the ground. There was a soft whomping noise, and the air flickered and glowed. Please, Adam, you have to go or you'll die in here. He shook his head, still pulling at the belt. There was a shriek from outside, then the window right next to her shattered. A pair of rough, bloody hands reached in. She screamed, fingers like steel rods in her skull. Another crash, a cutthroat grin slithering in through the boot and bloodied fingernails around Adam's throat. Daisy's vision was fading, the pain too much. 
And the worst of it was that as the shadows and the smoke crept into her head, turning everything to dusk, she could only hear Rilke's voice. I told you, it said. Why don't you listen? But if Rilke was right and they were really here to murder the world, then Daisy didn't really want to live any more anyway. She would rather be with her mum and her dad wherever they were. At least this way she could go home. She let go of the claws that ripped at her scalp and reached out to Adam. It's going to be okay, she said. We're going together and I'll always look after you. Even though he was being dragged from the car, Adam seemed to hear. He stuck out his hand, stretching his fingers towards her. And incredibly, he was smiling. It's not such a bad way to leave, Daisy thought, looking at a smile. And offering him one back, she grabbed hold of his hand. Brick. Hemingway, 6.27pm. Brick was only ten metres away when the car exploded. The upturned jag was surrounded, five policemen kicking and punching it, trying to get inside. One of them had his hands through the back window, and Brick could make out a familiar face in the billowing smoke. Daisy. Rage boiled up from his stomach, howled from his mouth as a ragged scream. Leave her alone! There was a flash of pure white light, a bubble which expanded from the car and blasted away the smoke. Brick threw himself to the ground, a hand over his face, waiting for the fire. It never came. He looked up to see that searing white light engulf the police, burning through them. They crumbled into ash like sticks of dry wood, filling the air with a snowstorm of burning embers. The blinding orb flickered, then was sucked back into the car with lightning speed. A shockwave blasted across the field, a crack of thunder that almost knocked Brick's head off. Then, an impossible silence. He worked his way unsteadily to his feet, swaying. Behind him, Cal was doing the same, wiggling his fingers in his ears as though he'd gone deaf. They peered back through the infinite quiet to see the surging mass of police still stampeding towards them from the road, not yet close enough for the fury. In the other direction, the jag sat inside its blizzard of incandescent ash, no sign of life anywhere near it. What happened? Cal's voice sounded a mile away. Brick flexed his jaw, noises gradually easing their way back into the world. The helicopter had pulled back from the explosion, but it was hovering above them again, the downdraft making Cal's hair billow. Brick didn't answer him. He just started running again. It was only after a couple of steps that he realised he'd dropped the half-empty sack of food. <laughs> Not that it mattered. As hungry as it was, as hungry as it was, it didn't look likely that any of them would live long enough to eat again. He reached the car in seconds and dropped to his knees beside it. Hot ash danced around his face, burning his skin where it landed. He brushed the falling flakes of dead people away, peering into the crushed darkness to see Chris there. Daisy? Cal yelled, ducking down next to him. They both looked into the back seat. It was empty. He must have dropped them somewhere. Come on, help me get him out. But I just saw her, Brick started wondering if he'd only imagined her face in the churning chaos. Cal tried the door, but it was crumpled into itself. He stood back and kicked the splintered glass of the window, reaching through the gap and calling Chris's name. Brick looked up, the mob of cops maybe 30 metres away, close enough to make the ground shudder. There was an army of them. He pushed in beside Cal, both of them trying to loosen the seatbelt. There was a pool of blood in the bottom of the car, still dripping off the tip of Chris's nose. He was unconscious, his motionless bulk making it impossible to free him. Brick glanced up again. Twenty metres, and the ones at the front were already turning. He grabbed Cal's shoulders, pulling him out of the window. We can't leave him, Cal shouted, throwing himself back, wrenching at the boy inside. We have to, Brick said. Fifteen metres, a line of witches' faces. Cal, come on! He grabbed Cal's arms and ripped him free, hauling him up. Look! They stared at the wave of uniforms, the grunts and howls and shrieks and growls almost too much to bear. Cal looked back at Chris. I'm so sorry, mate, he said. Then they were both running again, bolting from the madness at their heels. I'd forgotten about Chris. <laughs> sorry, Chris. Daisy. Hemingway, 6.29pm. Daisy felt like she'd been inside a tumble dryer, her head spinning and her stomach churning. She doubled over, a jet of milky vomit erupting from her mouth. 
Flecks of fire settled in the mess, hissing as their heat was extinguished. The air was alive with fireflies, those same glowing embers that she'd seen back in the restaurant with Rilke. She realised there was a hand in hers and she looked to see Adam there, a halo of ash circling his head, dropping onto his shoulders. He was still smiling. Daisy stood up, reeling. She was standing in a field, uh, the same field, but their upside-down silver car was all the way over there. She spun round to see the deserted showroom right next to her, and behind it, the towering, toothless grin of the big wheel inside Fursville. We, we moved ourselves, she realised. We touched hands and somehow got from over there to over here. Gradually, pieces of reality were clicking back into place, the sound of sirens and the fat black fly that hovered over the distant car. Squinting into the sun, she could make out a swarm of people stampeding across the other side of the field, and two more sprinting towards her. Cal! she shouted, recognising them. Brick! She tightened her grip on Adam's hand and started running, stumbling over the lumpy earth and through knotted traps of long grass until they were within earshot. Daisy! Cal was calling. Are you okay? I'm okay, she said, skidding to a halt, panting. The two boys galloped up to her, both of them drenched in sweat. They all looked back across the field. The car was invisible beneath a mass of writhing, black-suited forms, the helicopter hanging over them and making the whole horrible, horrible scene swim in the dust. Chris, said Daisy, the tears bubbling up even though she didn't want them to. Whatever they'd done, her and Adam, they'd left him behind. She peered through the blur to see Cal shaking his head. I'm so sorry, Daisy. We couldn't get him out. There's still time. She didn't say it, though. Because that was a lie. We should go, said Brick. We might be able to hide inside the park. It's our only shot. But none of them moved, watching as the horde tore its way into the upturned car. And they all felt it when Chris died. A sudden, cold shadow in their heads, as though something had been switched off. A burning shape seemed to claw its way out of the wreck, a flickering, insubstantial figure made of flame. It spread its huge, graceful wings, opened its mouth as if to howl, then evaporated into the heat and noise of the meadow. That was Chris's angel, Daisy thought. It, it died too. Come on, said Brick. We should go. Daisy looked for a moment more, seeing the police seemed to snap out of a trance. Some of them had red, glistening hands. She hated them so much. It didn't matter that they hadn't known what they were doing, that it wasn't really their fault. They'd still murdered him. Some of them were already turning to face her, pointing and shouting. The helicopter banked, sweeping towards the park. They clambered over the broken fence that led back into Soapy's, running past the bodies of the security guard and the policeman. The ambulance lay to their right, just a smoking shell, but there was nobody else in sight. Daisy looked up as they jogged across the road, seeing the sign that Brick had painted over. Furyville. Cal disappeared into the thick hedge, and the rest of them followed. Only in the welcome coolness of the shade did Brick turn to her. What happened back there? he asked. In the car. I saw you inside it, then you, then you vanished. It was the angels, she said. Rilke was right. They moved us. They, they saved us. And what happens now? he asked. Something bad, I think, she said, shaking her head. I don't know. She didn't know, but hadn't she already seen it? The park drowning in flames and Rilke standing in the middle of the inferno, laughing. What choice did they have, though? Outside there was only the fury, there was only death. At least in here, they were together. Brick held her gaze for a moment more. Then he took her hand and led her into the park. I am like bursting for a wee, but we've only got like oh, 23 pages left. Let's try, let's do it, let's do it. Suck it up, Gordon. Rilke, Furyville, 6.33pm. They're here, said Schiller. Rilke straightened at the sound of her brother's voice, the first words he'd spoken since all this started. He sounded the same and yet different. There was a hidden depth to that familiar, whining tone. Something ageless which resonated inside her skull. She stared at him. 
His hands were still alight, painting the room in a shimmering glow. As she watched, the fire spread up his arms, engulfing his torso and his neck, and finally his face. His eyes were two raging suns, their light overwhelming. Rilke gazed into them, and it was like she was looking through her twin into a realm of pure being, a place of terrifying, mesmerising power. I'm getting a phone call, um, but I shall leave it. It's just my dad. Hi, Dad, if you ever watch these videos. I don't think you do, but hi. <laughs> um, Schiller shrugged, and this time two translucent wings unfurled elegantly behind him, stretching over his head like twin sails. They seemed to shimmer in and out of being, as if they were made from nothing more than air and heat. He extended them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have to just hang up on him, otherwise it's going to keep ringing. Sorry, Dad. They seemed to shimmer in and out of being as if they were made from nothing more than air and heat. He extended them, their tips almost bridging the gap between the restaurant walls, and when he folded them again, they unleashed a hurricane of wind. It sent Marcus and Jade rolling across the room, tables and chairs crashing into the walls. But Rilke held her ground against the cold blast, kneeling before her brother like someone praying at an altar. She had never loved him more. You know what you have to do, Rilke said to him. He cocked his head, unsure. I, I think so. You know so, Rilke said, standing and taping, taking a deep... <laughs> Maybe I've pushed myself too far. You know so, Rilke said, standing and taking a step towards him. Because I've told you why you're here, why this is happening. Don't disappoint me, Schiller. Don't disappoint them. Schiller's fire flared, and he smiled at her. I won't, sister. I promise. Jade was crawling frantically back, her eyes like saucers. She lay prostrate beside Rilke, laughing. Marcus huddled against the back wall, shaking his head. Schiller extended his wings again, and with a gentle effort, he raised himself into the air. He began to move, not walking, just gliding a foot or so off the ground. Beneath him, things seemed to grow from the floor, tremulous shapes that looked like budding plants, but which were made of flame, twisting and dissolving after a second or two. Where is he going? asked Jade. To do what he was called here to do, Rilke said, watching her brother float ghost-like towards the doors. He pushed through them, and the wood evaporated at his touch, blossoming into a cloud of dust and ash which defied gravity, buoyed up by the energy that was streaming from him. Rilke followed him as he descended the stairs. Jade huddled against her, Marcus too, all of them treading carefully over the carpet of glowing tendrils in Schiller's wake. He still gave off that subsonic hum, a sound that made the air tremble. To do what we were all called here to do, Rilke said. She was giddy with excitement, a surge of insane glee which rattled up her throat and exploded from her grinning lips. He's going to start a war. Cal, Furyville, 6.35pm. Brick led the way down the side of the boo-boo station, his face a grimace of panic as the helicopter swept overhead. A tornado of rubbish swirled in the narrow alley, the world shaken by the helicopter's relentless thunder. Cal kept hold of Daisy's hand, screw screwing his eyes shut against the grit, trying to remember the way. He could hear Brick calling out. Where are we going? At least that's what it sounded like. There was no air anymore, just the howling dust. He opened his eyes as much as he dared, pointing up the path. Pavilion! he shouted. It wouldn't exactly be safe, but there was nowhere else to go. In seconds, the park would be infested with police, all of them feral. If they could get inside, then they might be able to barricade the doors, hold up until they thought of a plan. Brick shrugged, cupping a hand to his ear. Pavilion! Cal repeated, as loud as he could manage. He didn't wait to see if Brick had understood, just dragged Daisy to the end of the path, then up past the carousel. The chopper banked around the big wheel, the wind easing up. In the sudden lull, Cal could make out voices behind them. He looked back in time to see the main gates balloon inwards, spitting shrapnel. There was the growl of an engine, and with a massive crunch the chains snapped. A Land Rover barreled into the park, its bonnet smoking, and a river of police streamed after it. Do not move! one of them shouted, pointing right at Cal, or we will open fire! Open fire? Three helmeted cops with submachine guns ran to the front of the park. They crouched, aiming the weapons down the path. Even from here, Cal could see that their fingers were on the triggers. Who could blame them? They'd just seen their mates get blown to ash. 
He slung his hands up, turning to the others, mouthing, what do we do? But there was nothing they could do. If they ran, the chances were they'd be mown down. If they stayed, they'd be torn to pieces as soon as the cops got close enough. We're just kids, Cow shouted. Don't shoot. Stay where you are, shouted the same man as before. Some of the cops were moving cautiously forwards. Please don't, Daisy said, sobbing. If you come near us, then bad things will happen. Please stay away. Yeah, said Brick, his voice cracked in a hundred places. We've got a bomb. The police hesitated. A bomb, said Cal, looking at Brick. They're definitely going to shoot us now. We need you to put the device on the ground, the man shouted, his words almost drowned out by the helicopter that circled overhead. And step away. Do this now or we will be forced to shoot. Now what, Cal said. How the hell do I know, Brick spat. He took a step backwards, his hands locked in his hair. Brick, stay still for God's sake, Cal said. But the boy wasn't listening, taking another step and another. His body was tense, like he was going to bolt. Brick, said Cal, don't. As he spoke, he realised that the helicopter wasn't the loudest sound in the park anymore. There was something else, a hum inside his head, soft but deafening. It was like the noise an amp makes when you stick in an electric guitar but don't play any notes. A dull buzz which was making his skull vibrate. Brick could obviously hear it too because he clamped his hands to his ears, crying out. A howling shriek. One of the cops stepping past that invisible line of the fury. His face shriveled into something that was only just human, white rage driving him on. Someone else, a policewoman, chased after him, turning feral, both of them hurling themselves down the path. There was nothing else to do. Cal turned and ran. They all did, as the air behind them was torn apart by gunfire. Brick, Furyville, 6.39pm. Adrenaline made the world turn in slow motion. Something whistled past Brick's ear, sounding like a hornet, stinging his flesh. He ducked down, his arms and legs like pistons as, pistons as he sprinted towards the pavilion, his brain screaming, not me, not me, not me, in time with every pounding step. He didn't look back, not because of the fear, but because of the guilt of leaving the others. He made it halfway before he saw it, the sight stripping away every grain of strength and making him crash to his knees. Schiller floated from the pavilion, bathed in flames, the building's walls literally peeling away from him like the edges of burning paper. His feet didn't touch the ground, an invisible force holding him up. Something extended from his back, a pair of wings made up of gossamer-thin flames. The boy's face wasn't his anymore. His eyes were twin furnaces which blazed out across the park, devoid of all emotion. It was the most terrifying thing that Brick had ever seen. There was more gunfire, but it was distant now. It no longer seemed to matter. Brick heard cries, the cry of the fury, but he couldn't quite remember how to be scared. He could only gaze at Schiller as the boy advanced. He would look at him forever, even if it burned his eyes from their sockets. Was it possible that a creature like this lived inside him too, dormant for now but ready to wake and embrace the same power? For the first time he believed it. He believed what Rilke had said. Schiller reached him making the path erupt into a forest of fiery plants which curled up and vanished as quickly as they appeared. The hum in the air was incredible, a current of pure energy. Brick shuffled around on his knees, watching the boy, the, the angel, as he glided towards the front of the park. It was chaos over there. Cal was on the ground, pinned by two cops, his legs kicking out helplessly as they tore at him. Daisy and Adam were still running, both of them blinding by te blinded by tears. Behind them was a seething wall of feral police. The three men with guns were still firing. A bullet punched through Daisy's shoulder, emerging from the other side and dragging a comet tail of dark red blood behind it. The impact threw her forwards, rolling her over in the dirt until she slid to a halt, motionless. Daisy! Brick shouted. He raced over, skidding down beside her and lifting her head. Her eyes were open, but they weren't seeing anything. Adam was there too, holding her hand in both of his, tugging on it like he was trying to wake her up. No! Brick shouted, the word as weak and useless as he was. Drowned out by the gunfire and the roar of the helicopter and that endless nightmare hum. 
Brick lifted Daisy up and pushed his hand against the wound, blood spilling through his fingers, so hot it felt like it was scalding him. He held her, wanting it to be over, wanting it all to end. It was just too much. Schiller turned his head, surveying the park with those soulless pockets of light. The men with guns had turned their weapons on him, aside from one who had ripped off his helmet and was gouging at his own face in a fit of insanity. The bullets seemed to freeze when they reached the boy, hanging in the air in front of him and forming a shimmering curtain of lead. With a swipe of his hand, Schiller scattered the bullets in all directions, a dozen cops thrown backwards as their heads and chests exploded. Kill them, Brick screamed silently, and he wanted it more than anything. These pathetic, murderous humans who'd broken into his home, who'd attacked his friends, they had given up their right to life. He clutched Daisy to him, firing out the message to the boy who hung in his cradle of flame. Kill them all. Kill them now. A hand dropped onto his shoulder, and he looked up to see Rilke there. Jade and Marcus were behind her, both of them transfixed by this creature before them. Rilke smiled at him. He will, she said, turning her face up, bathed in her brother's glow. Watch. Schiller opened his arms, like he was about to hug someone. His eyes settled on the police. More and more of them were turning feral, running up the path towards the angel. Even the ones that had been stamping on cows switched their target, throwing themselves at the burning boy. They didn't even get close. Without so much as touching them, Schiller lifted the two closest men into the air and turned them inside out, their bodies folding and refolding until they were nothing more than mangled meat. He flicked his hand and the ruined corpses sailed over the park, rising into the darkening sky as though launched by a catapult. The other ferals didn't notice and continued to charge mindlessly towards him with bared teeth and clawed fingers. Schiller cocked his head and another dozen cops were scooped up by the same invisible force. This time they were thrown at each other, crushed into a giant sphere of flailing limbs. It spun wildly, growing smaller and smaller with a chorus of cracking bones until those twelve men and women were no bigger than a beach ball. The knotted lump of flesh slammed into the ground with enough force to shatter the concrete, a web of cracks stretching out from the crater. Ah, oh, this isn't right, something in brick protested. He pushed it aside, he didn't want to hear it. The helicopter was retreating, pulling up fast. Schiller pumped those vast wings and launched himself into the air. He rose alongside the machine, and even though he didn't lay a finger on it, the rotors buckled and twisted, breaking free with an ear-shattering squeal. The rest of the chopper began to crumple, something red and wet blossoming in behind the shattered windscreen. Then the wreck jolted to the side with incredible force, ploughing a hole through the pavilion and the fence beyond, carving a mile-long trench across the surface of the sea. The ferals were still coming, but Schiller had only just started to experiment with his powers. He dropped back down, stopping just above the ground and stretching his arms out once again. The electrical hum grew louder, making Brick's eardrums feel like they were about to implode. The flames around the boy were as bright as magnesium flares, burning a hole in the very surface of reality. His mouth opened, a pocket of utter brilliance. And he spoke. His word, sorry, his voice was wordless and world-ending. It was a roar that ripped through the air and shook the ground to dust. Everything before it fractured and disintegrated. The concrete and the stone beneath, the Land Rover, the bricks in the walls, the metal gates, the flesh and blood and bones of the ferals, the mud and grass in the field beyond. A tidal wave of broken matter which rose into the air, blotting out every last scrap of sunlight. Brick cried out, teetering on the brink of madness as that cloud rose and rose into an endless lightless night. Then Schiller's voice died, and the night died with it, a million tons of debris falling back to its resting place. Brick curled into himself, the noise impossible, utterly terrifying. The world shook and shook and shook, and finally fell silent. Cal, Furyville, 7.05pm. For as far as he could see, the world was an ocean of ruin, a landscape of rubble and plundered earth, rent and broken all the way to the distant factory. 
Even that hadn't escaped unscathed, pillars of smoke rising in front of the glowering sun like prison bars. Dust was still falling, a rain of dirt and blood and bone which pattered onto the vast grave that had once been Hemingway. Every part of Cal was in pain. He thought his nose might be broken and there were welts all over his face and neck where the ferals had torn at him. One of his fingers was bent at an odd angle, too sore to touch. He cradled it against his chest. He should be grateful, because he was alive. But he wasn't. The cost of his survival was too great. It wasn't just the town that was gone. Everything he knew had been irrevocably changed. It took him a moment to find the courage to look around. The first thing he saw was Schiller. The boy sat on the path, his legs curled up to his chest. No trace of the flames or the wings or those star-burned eyes. He was shivering and his sister crouched beside him, her arms locked around his shoulders. Jade and Marcus stood close by, holding each other. Brick was on the other side of the path, next to Adam. He was holding something, and when Cal realised it was Daisy, he pushed himself up, stumbling over to them. The girl was deathly pale, an ugly, gaping wound in her shoulder. But she was alive. Her soft, shallow breathing filled him with such an overwhelming sense of relief that he didn't notice the ice until he touched her. She was freezing. He pulled his hand away like he'd had an electric shock. Her skin was pearled with frost and the chill that emanated from her was like a winter breeze. Daisy, he whispered, stroking her cheek. Daisy, can you hear me? She isn't answering, said Brick, his teeth chattering. The tears had frozen in the corners of his eyes on, in, on his cheeks, hanging there like glass beads. It's just like Schiller. She's changing, said Rilke, matter-of-factly. She didn't want this, said Cal. Make it stop. Rilke shook her head. None of us can make it stop. Didn't you see him? Don't you understand what we're capable of? She laughed, a chuckle of amazement. It was wonderful. Schiller saved you, Cal. He saved all of us. He had. There was no doubt about it. Without him, they would have all been trampled into the dirt. Rilke's twisted logic battered against his mind. Was she right? Was this really why they were here? To uproot all of humankind, to purge their species from the face of the earth? He looked out across the wasteland that Schiller had created, only it wasn't a wasteland. It looked more like a field which had been ploughed and furrowed, which was ready for something new. And the peace that hung over it, free of shouts and screams and sirens, it was perfect. And yet still that nagging doubt, the feeling that Rilke was wrong, that she was making an awful mistake. Daisy will be okay, said Rilke. She got to her feet, hooking an arm under her brother and hoisting him up. Schiller smiled at her, just a boy again, but that power was still there, his to call on. Cal knew this the same way he knew that he too would someday go cold, and that something terrible would break through his soul. We'll all be okay, said Rilke. You'll see, Cal, it might take a day, it might take a week but you'll see. It doesn't hurt, said Schiller, his voice weak and quiet, almost exactly the same pitch as his sister's. After seeing him burning through the sky, ravaging the earth, Cal could make no sense of the young boy before him. It's like, it's like there's something in your body, but it doesn't control you. It doesn't force you to do anything. It just makes you strong. It keeps you safe. Don't fight it. it it's, it, it's... He obviously couldn't find the word, but his rapturous expression said everything. But it told you why we're here, didn't it? Said Rilke, to rage war with the humanity? Schiller's eyes fell, scouring the ground for a truth he couldn't quite find. Rilke's grip on him tightened, so hard that Cal saw the boy wince. Tell them, little brother. Uh, yes, that's why we're here, he said, trying to break away. But for all his newfound power, he couldn't find the strength to free himself from her. His eyes met Cal's and there was fear in them, fear and a heartbreaking sadness. That's why we're here. Rilke started walking, her brother taking small, cautious steps like somebody using his legs for the first time. Marcus ran to the boy's other side, looping Schiller's arm around his shoulder and taking his weight. Jade finished the procession, brushing her hair from her eyes and glancing nervously at Cal. "'You don't have a choice,' said Rilke, as she walked patiently by her stumbling brother's side. "'No matter where you go, no matter what you do, the same thing will happen.' 
People will try to hurt you and you will fight back. They won't leave you alone. They can't. It's in their nature. And that rotten, violent, corrupt nature is why we're here. We got it wrong. It isn't their fury that will change the world. It's ours. She looked down at Brick, the warm, gentle smile never leaving her face. Just think about it. Try to imagine what this world will be like when our job is done. Cal could imagine it. Nothing but sunshine and peace. No, 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 the protest railed, a drumbeat in his skull. Look after her, Rilke said, stepping onto the ocean of dirt, her feet kicking up clouds of black ash which had once been buildings and cars and people. It will be easier for you when she wakes. Where are you going? Cal asked. Nowhere and everywhere, was her answer. When you're ready, you'll know how to find us. Cal watched her walk into the reddening sky with her flock, Schiller, Jade and Marcus, the dust of the world raining down at their feet. We need to go too, said Brick. This place will be swarming soon. We should find somewhere safe. <laughs> safe. Rilke was right. There was nowhere safe any more. They would be hunted wherever they went. Cal looked down at Daisy, radiating coldness, her eyes iced over, her small face expressionless. He wondered where she was and what she could see there. He wondered if she knew what she would become when she woke. Yeah, he said, getting up. You're right, let's go. My mum's car's still down the beach, by the toilets. We can use that. You want me to carry her? I'm okay, Brick said, struggling to his feet with Daisy in his arms. He shuddered with the cold, his words billowing from blue lips. You can take him. Come on, little guy, said Cal, scooping up Adam, wincing as pain lanced down his broken finger. The boy didn't react, staring at something only he could see. Don't worry, yeah? It's going to be okay, said Cal. No, it's not, said Brick. Whole planet's going to hell. Thanks. Way to make him feel better. Up yours, Brick said. But there was a glimmer of a smile in his eyes. It spread to Cal, and even though it had no place here, it felt good. You really are an arsehole, he said through a grin as they staggered across the park. Brick looked around, sighing. Then he turned back to Cal. I know. Epilogue, last chapter. Whoever battles with monsters had better see that it does not turn him into a monster. And if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. Frederick Nietzsche. Daisy. She had always thought that death would be peaceful, a place of infinite calm and quiet. But Daisy stood inside a kingdom of fire and ice, of relentless movement and noise. She was at the junction of a billion different lives, the joining place of worlds. From here, she could see everything. She had been shot. She knew that much, at least. They had been inside the park, Furzville, running from the police. Then she'd felt like she'd been struck by a sledgehammer. She couldn't remember hitting the floor. It'd been more like she'd fallen through the floor, through the skin of the real world and into what lay beyond. She'd been like Alice tumbling down the rabbit hole, only what she was looking at now was no wonderland. And there was no sign of her mum and dad. She'd hoped at the very least they'd be here, waiting for her. It's because you're not dead, something said. Was that her own voice? She couldn't be sure. Everything was too chaotic. Who's there? She called out. Where am I? No answer. She focused on the wheeling shapes around her, all inside ice cubes, just like the ones in her head. They made no sense. Countless flickering images and muddled sounds in each one. Daisy, can you hear me? The voice seemed to cut through the rest, and with it one of the ice cubes grew larger, groaning and cracking like an iceberg as it filled her vision. It was Brick, his copper hair glowing in the sun, his clothes ripped to tatters and covered in blood. It seemed like his chest was on fire, an orb of blue flame which sat where his heart should be. He was holding something in his arms, a tiny shape whose head lolled, whose eyes were open and unseeing. It was her, she realised. But she wasn't scared because she too had a smokeless inferno inside her chest, one that burned even brighter. It's them. That's where they live. And with that thought, the ice cube melted. Another rose in its place, and through it she saw more people she knew. Rilke was helping her brother, Schiller, walk across an endless field of dust and dirt. Marcus and Jade staggered alongside them, their shadows long in the setting sun. 
They all had flames in their chests too, except Schiller, whose whole body was alight. He seemed to have another shape laid over his own, a figure with blazing eyes and huge sphinx-like wings which left growing, glowing tails, trails, glowing trails where they dragged in the ground. Looking at it made Daisy feel scared and excited at the same time. That's what they that's what they look like when they've she paused until the word hatched popped into her head. Yes, when they've hatched. They can't survive in our world, so they have to live inside us. The image changed again. Did that mean she was right? Was this a test, maybe? She swept towards Rilke, into the girl's head, the world unravelling and reforming. This time she saw people, hundreds of them, maybe thousands. Schiller stood amongst them, his face emotionless as he spread his hands and turned those men and women and children to dust. She could just about see Rilke there too, grinning insanely before the scene was lost in a billowing cloud of ash. So this is why we're here, Daisy said, her heart dropping to her toes. But I don't want to hurt anyone. People do sometimes do bad things, and some of them aren't very nice, but most are, are kind and funny and peaceful. They don't deserve to die. The same scene again, Schiller slaughtering countless more innocents. Daisy seemed to understand what she was being shown. That's what Rilke sees, she said. But she's wrong, isn't she? We're not here to kill people. We're here to save them. The shadows of the last scene melted away, the ice cubes clinking. Even though she had no body in this place, no face, she still felt like she was grinning. I knew it, she told the angel inside her. I knew you weren't bad. Her happiness didn't last, though. Another image swelled, this one even worse than the last. Daisy knew what she was going to see there, but she could not close her eyes. She felt herself pulled into the scene, battered by a wind that stank of flesh and smoke. The man in the storm hung inside a nest of fractured darkness, his mouth a churning, grinding whirlwind. That same horrid, deafening sound, the endless, inward breath, made her skin crawl. Daisy screamed without sound, struggling to escape, but there was nowhere to go. She could do nothing but watch as the man in the storm opened his arms and more of the world shattered like glass, falling into a bottomless, lightless abyss. It was impossible not to notice how similar he was to Schiller, but this thing was utter evil, the opposite of life. The man in the storm turned his dead, scribble black eyes towards her, and somewhere in the awful sound was a sickening, gleeful laugh. He tilted his corpse hands, and even from this distance, even though she was only seeing it inside her head, she could feel the light draining out of her, the happiness and the love. It was leaving her utterly empty. He's why we're here, Daisy spat, squirming, praying that it was the right answer, and that the scene would fade away like the others. He's a bad man, and he's doing something terrible, and we have to stop him. Cracks began to appear in the view, a golden glow spilling through them until the man in the storm disappeared in the haze. Daisy walked into the heat like she was stepping onto a beach in the middle of summer. There was nothing here but light. Who are you? she asked. Are you angels? No answer. The view didn't change. Did that mean she was right or wrong? Or maybe she was a little of both. Maybe they weren't angels, but something else. Something that people had caught glimpses of over the centuries and which had been given that name. There were all sorts of things that people didn't know about yet. Who's to say that creatures like this couldn't exist? Daisy realised that there was a face in the light. So faint that it almost wasn't there at all. It was devoid of all emotion and feeling, its eyes burning sockets. It seemed to constantly peel apart and repair itself, as though it couldn't hold its shape for longer than a few seconds. Those blazing eyes looked at Daisy, so much power there that she could hear it in the air like an endless roll of thunder. This is my angel, she understood, her terror and her awe like a white heat inside her. Then, just like that, the light fell apart, the face dissolving into the fading glow. Daisy felt herself pulled away, so fast she left her stomach behind. She landed somewhere dark and cold, but she could feel that creature in every cell of her body, its fire spreading. Voices, ones she recognised, echoing in the shadows. Which way? Anyway, just get us out of here. She would wake up soon enough, and when she did she would be something different, something more. But Cal and Brick and Adam would still be there, they'd look after her. She'd look after them too. That was her job now, at least until their angels hatched. 
And when that happened, they'd all be ready. Ready to fight the man in the storm. And there we go. That's the end. And I am going to be myself. Um if I don't get off here in a minute. So um, uh, really lovely to see you all. Thank you for listening to The Fury. I'm coming back probably tomorrow with The Storm, uh, which is where we see everybody fighting uh, the man in the storm. And uh, and we'll find out the truth about what is lying inside our characters. Uh, I forgot how much I love that NC. Um, the chaos and then Schiller emerging like this boat, like this icebreaker cracking out of the building and then using his powers to squidge everyone into big lumps of meat. Anyway, enough of that. Thank you very much for joining me for another another slice of Gordy TV. And uh, yeah, I'll see you very soon. Take care. Love you guys. Have fun. <laughs>